Okay, welcome back everyone. Hello, hello. I think some of us are joining the session for the first time. Some are coming back to the conference from the morning and the afternoon. So I will um, take the time to just briefly introduce myself before introducing our wonderful speakers for this session three of our primary care conference for today. So my name is Aliyah Bab Benjamin and I am project and insight manager at National Voices and I've been blown away really by the discussions and the really thought-provoking conversations that we've had up until this point today. So I don't doubt that the rest of the sessions uh, today will also follow suit. So then this session now we will be in conversation, in conversation, and we'll have two thought leaders in health and care. So we're actually really hoping for this session to be a reflective and an informal space, an opportunity to discuss um, what is most important in terms of the future of primary care and National Voices vision within that as well. So I'd just like to encourage us all to please, if possible, keep ourselves on mute uh, when you're not speaking. And as well, I know that we are, some of us, just finishing off our lunches, but when we can, coming to the camera, putting on our videos as well, so that we can kind of almost feel as though we're in the same room, um, if you feel comfortable to do so. Um, so for those that are just joining us that maybe aren't aware of our functionality for this session today, um, we have closed captions which are enabled, and we do also have um, speech to text translation as well, so the link can be reprovided into the chat, but this is an opportunity for those who might need that functionality to be able to access it. Um, and then we also have two British Sign Language interpreters who are here and available for anyone who might need assistance um, with uh, British uh, Sign Language interpretation. Uh, if that is you and you haven't been able to make us aware of that before today, then you can pop uh, Lucy, my colleague Lucy, a message in the chat and she'll be able to support with this. Uh, this session is recorded as you will have seen either joining into the meeting or if you've been with us before now. Um, and that is so that it will be available via our YouTube channel later on for those who aren't able to join for the entirety of the session today. So I'm really, really happy and excited to introduce Sean Linton, who is our um, uh, one of our speakers for today. He is the health editor at the Sunday Times. Uh, I think he'll be pinned for us shortly. Um, and Sean has an investigative um, health journalist background and has been so for over a decade and um, he's helped expose some of the worst scandals in NHS history um, including the Shropshire and Telford um, maternity disaster um, and also poor care just more generally at the mid Staffordshire NHS Trust um, and subsequent public inquiry as well so he has extensive and vast experience um, today and then we will also hear from uh, Professor Claire Fuller who is also here with us today. Hello, Claire, uh, lovely to see you. And she is a practicing GP and chief executive of Surrey um, Heartland's Integrated Care System and author of the Fuller Stop Take, of course. So there will be the opportunity um, to hear a little bit more from Claire. So for those who maybe are new to the Fuller Stop Take in November, 2021, Claire was invited by um, the chief executive um, of NHS England, Amanda Pritchard, to lead a national piece of work um, looking at the primary care kind of within integrated care systems to identify what was working um, well and why and then also to kind of investigate what, what still needs to improve. So the out kind of put of that became known as the Fuller Stock Take um, and was co-signed by all of the 42 ICS chief, chief executives as well. Um, so lots of commitments to the recommendations and really looking forward to um, listening in today to this uh, conversation. Um, around the stock take published just over a year ago um, and also what next what next so I'd like to hand over to Sean who can maybe kick us off in our conversation today thank you both for joining us thanks, thanks very much Alea and uh, thanks very much Claire for letting me uh, do an interview with you in front of uh, many hundreds of people it's not the usual process for me to do interviews but with an audience <laughs> but uh, so this should be fun for both of us what can possibly go wrong, Sean? <laughs> oh, exactly, exactly. Um, but just before I, I start sort of uh, grilling you, Claire, I, I thought uh, I just wanted to offer my own reflections, really, because, you know, as a health journalist, I think I, I'm in a bit of a privileged position in the, in the sense that I'm an observer. I'm, I'm watching the system play out and I don't really have any skin in the game. And for me, with primary care at the moment and I think this conversation is effectively going to be the fuller stock take part two um, because I want, I'm very keen to get your sense of where we are 
But a, approaching this from my professional role, what I see is a system that is in, in real difficulty on, on one side of the equation. There is, you know, we are seeing real time falling numbers of fully qualified GPs in primary care. I think the latest data is something like 430 GPs down, which is the wrong direction and not where we want to be going. Uh, and also the, the, there was some data recently around the number of GP appointments, one in six last only five minutes. You know, the staff are under real pressure. They're, they're working in practices that aren't particularly great. The estate is poor. And a lot of these things you highlighted in your report, but that's on one side of the equation. But I, I think what's interesting for me is on the other side, we see a system that is kind of recognizing where it is. Uh, there is commitment to make improvements in primary care and and also beyond the traditional primary care that people like myself might write about the GP patient appointment you know we're broadening that definition out now to include generally care out in in the community uh, and so how those two things balance up is really interesting and how we work through those challenges and try and achieve those opportunities and we, the status quo just isn't going to work because we know public satisfaction with primary care is is nose diving understandably people are struggling to get through to their gps and i i hear from gps all the time about how hard they are working to maintain a good service but but i also hear from patients who are, are infuriated that they just can't get through that they are passed from pillar to post that appointments from secondary care and primary care information isn't shared and you know people are given letters to pass to their GP and a lot of patients find that sort of thing just a, a little bit outdated and old-fashioned and so we've got to think about how we marry that all up to get to a better place and so that's kind of where I see things it's both really challenging but there is some exciting developments going on um so Claire let's bring you into this now I, I'm very keen to understand as an opening kind of question you know, we're more than a year on, I think, from when you published your report. Um, what's your stop take as of June 2023? Before we go on to that, I just want to correct one thing you said, Sean. Yeah. So you said satisfaction with general practice is plummeting. It isn't. Satisfaction of access to general practice has dropped, but satisfaction with the care that people receive is still up at 8%. And I think it's really important that we get that straight. Mm -hmm. So people are, and I'm not going to deny that people are struggling to, uh, are struggling with access of getting appointments. And we can talk about how, what we can do to improve that. But when people get care, 80% of people are, say that the care is good. And I yeah, just, that's a really just, important point. Yeah. We need to get that out there. So, stop take where we are. So, um, and just in terms of as so my uh, my pedigree for for why I'm sitting here talking about this. Really. So, I'm a uh, I've been a GP now for longer than I haven't. I'm a third generation GP. I've been a partner. I've been a salaried doctor. I've been a retainer. I've been a locum. I've done rural, single handed. I've done urban. I've done. You know, I have done most flavors of general practice, um, big practices, small practices, uh, and feel very much in and of. The profession, which I think, coupled with the, uh, my management role, which is leading um, Surrey Hartland's integrated care system, I think put me in quite a unique position to write the stock take. And also, given that the uh, the receivers of the stock take, um, it was so we published just before ICSs became a thing, which is uh, we get get the anniversary on July the first, uh, and it was very much as uh, as a document to the newly formed ICSs for what we can do to improve the integration of primary care within within uh, integrated care systems so um i've just come from i was in i was in worthing this morning um, in sussex who we are holding uh, an incredible day looking at health inequalities within sussex um and their model for how they're delivering is based on integrated neighbor neighborhood teams within thriving places with fully functioning provider collaboratives so it is that that infrastructure on which they then base their data, their communications and their structure and the impact that they have already had by working really closely with the granular data at that neighbourhood, that 50,000 um, footprint, because they are engaging and talking to people about what matters to them is the way that we actually bring about change. So one year on, I think it's, um, I was reflecting when I was talking this morning, although I was sort of saying, uh, when it was when it was published, I came off all social media. I left the country for two weeks uh, and was expecting um, 
well, I wasn't expecting quite the 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 uh, response that, that the report got. And actually the fact that a year later, people are still talking about it, that each one of the 42 systems has published their baseline delivery against the sort of 15 recommendations, eight for ICSs and seven for um, central bodies. And they all publish, have all published where they are in terms of their delivery. Every, they all recognise an integrated neighbourhood team and understand where they are on, on uh, in terms of progressing delivery of it. And the the way we describe the model of care, it's a it's using neighbourhood teams, which are more than primary care networks, but to protect practices. And over the year that's gone, we've talked so much about access. You know, we have because of the British Social Attitude Survey, the National GP Survey, because of the, the political pressure and the primary care recovery plan is really sensible and pragmatic about how we improve the access. But the thing we haven't talked about is about continuity. And when we were doing the stock take, the thing we heard from both people and from professionals was the importance of continuity. So when I started, it was, you know, I started, I started in, um, in a sort of... Uh, commuter place called Banstead, which is in sort of the north of Surrey. And I had a, I was part on a list size, about 1500 patients, uh, no computers, no mobile phones. Uh, and we did everything. Um, visited people that went to hospital, if they were in the cottage hospital as well, then you'd go and visit them. The senior partner delivered all the babies. But I knew everybody. I knew where they lived. I knew where they were sleeping. I knew what they were eating. And I knew who had died and who they were related to. Mm -hmm. And that meant that when people came in, it was so much easier to get to the and what matters to you conversations because actually you're already halfway there. So somebody coming in with a cough isn't necessarily coming in with a cough. It may be because their gran had died from lung cancer or their neighbour had just been diagnosed. And that alters the conversation you're having because actually it's a bereavement conversation or it's a, these are the things that we need to do to work out what's going on. And that's what we've lost is that continuity. And the loss of the continuity is one of the things that's driving up the demand, which is why the access is getting worse. And so unless we do two sides of the coin, we'll never have enough workforce or enough capacity to actually reach the demand that we have. And you see this, you said, you know, um, how many appointments are actually down at five minutes? That's because of the demand that's there. I'll, I'll give you just my my one bit of your your my question back to you, Sean. So um, we've looked at our contacts across our whole system in terms of demand, and I've identified uh, all our places have identified the one percent of people that consume the most health care. And they've done it based on the John Hopkins methodology of likelihood of admission to hospital, and have then um, taken that top one percent. So one of the places is East Surrey, population about two hundred thousand. They've looked at the top 1% of their moderate high risk admissions is 600 people. And those 600 people, they then track the contacts okay, across the year. And they had 1,800 A&E attendances, 450 outpatient appointments and 400 inpatients. So Sean, how many GP contacts do you think they had on top of that? 600 people. So it's 1,800 A&E attendances, 450 outpatients, 400 in. How many GP contacts would you expect them to have had? I have absolutely no idea, but I'm going to ballpark 3,000. Okay, it's um, it's 54,000. Wow. Yep. Yeah. And it is that level of demand is why people can't get appointments. And it's that yeah. level of demand is why people are leaving. And, and just to just to hone in on that there, um, mm. so this group of patients, do mm. you see the neighbourhood team model as a way of almost... Yeah taking hold of those patients and almost yeah. wrapping around them to try and effectively stave off some of that that those contacts and head them off at the past kind of thing before it becomes a an a &E yeah. or a gp appointment so the the model of the neighborhood teams is to take away that capacity some of the bits that actually will be done better by us to leave the practices to do to be able to return to delivering care with as much quantity as possible so you take out the transactional um urgent care stuff which is stuff like uh, stuff like my children my eldest son always loses his, his eczema cream and he you know he doesn't care who he sees he just he knows what he wants in it you know that so actually it doesn't matter who he sees so take that take that sort of transactional stuff out uh and then my parents who would probably be in that it, it, for their area would be in that amount who are really complex you need a team around them to look after them a different way because what happens is because so my dad he's got uh he's got Parkinson's, he's got heart failure, he's got renal, he's got all of the, you know, he's got all of the failures. Yeah. Um, and he looks terrible, but actually he's not bad. But if you see him for the first time and you've not met him, you would admit him to hospital. 
because he's kind of gone, oh, my word. And so he doesn't go and see people unless they really know him. But then that sometimes means he waits too long and then he collapses at home and then he ends up in hospital. So we need to create a way that our most complex who strive and value the continuity can get access really quickly. And that's through the MDT bit of the of the neighbourhood team. Mm. Um, and what we and where they've done this in particularly in East Surrey that are slightly ahead of the curve, they have taken out uh, it is, I must get my numbers right, it is between about 15% of any attendances have dropped down. Um, and I think it's nearly getting up in some of them up to about 20% of the admissions. And they've also seen a drop of 20 to 30% within the GP contacts as well. And that's by putting a single point of contact in, creating an MDT. And the workforce they've used has been, they've, they've used the art, the additional roles, the additional roles, uh, reimbursement scheme roles to work in a team looking after that more complex bit. And the community services have realigned around that geography. Yeah. The primary care networks have realigned to geography, put teams in involves secondary care, community care, voluntary sector, the ARS roles and general practice to create a team around these people. And, and you mentioned workforce there and that's something I wanted to ask you about. The, the, the 26,000 additional roles in primary care that, that's been largely achieved yeah. and people are investing in those roles. But my question to you really is around are, are we taking the public with us on that journey? Because you know many members of the public when they ring their surgery they want to see their GP they do the public understand that actually it's better for them to see the the physio the pharmacist the district nurse etc do you do you think the public care about those distinctions or, or do they not or if they do are we doing enough to actually explain to them the change that they might that they might actually not see their GP for many appointments so I think you and your role have a really important part to play in terms of that national messaging and in terms of ex explaining that actually it isn't always a GP appointment that you want. Um, two points I want to make. Number one is really around the definition of primary care. So I think primary care is actually stuff you can access from your home without referral and secondary care is stuff you need a referral for. So at the moment we use primary care being synonymous with general practice in some sort of way we think it's more politically correct and we use secondary care as being synonymous with hospitals and it isn't. And when you go back to that definition of primary care, you can see it isn't then just about general practice. It isn't even about dentistry, optons and pharmacy. And I will always put a plea in for audiology. Why is audiology not part of that family when you do your eyes and your teeth? Why are your ears not in? But actually, things you can access from your home are sexual health services. They are school nurses. They are 999. They are 111. That is, but, but our job as health professionals is to connect it up and make it easier for people. So that actually the default isn't, I've got to have GP access. I've got to the GP. I did um, I did something for NHS at 75. I did some interviews with uh, a number of chief execs around the NHS. And one of the themes that came back about how much harder it has got to navigate our way through the system. And uh, mm -hmm. one of my colleagues was saying one of the earliest, earliest memories was being awoken by somebody banging on the door at three in the morning. And his mum was a district nurse and somebody in the village where they lived uh was in trouble, didn't want to bother the doctor, but knew, knew where she lived and banged on on the door. And his reflection was at the moment, and actually that role of the NHS has been part of societal infrastructure. And in and and in many ways the GP in that role has got clouded for many reasons which are around the increase in complexity due to the level of care that we're delivering due to the number of different types of workforce but we need to make it easy for people to find care when they need it mm. and I think people that have seen other roles and get value from them they have no problem so uh, people with long-term conditions I can promise you they would much rather see our diabetic nurse than see me They'd much rather see our respiratory nurse than come yeah. and see me because they know that they are specialists. And it's yeah. almost the understanding uh, the role and how they can be better. Yeah. And I think there's few people I think who would disagree with what you're saying. But I suppose my slight challenge back to you is that, you know, in my career, um, I've seen these these conversations and calls for this kind of shift uh, repeatedly. I mean, I remember the dawn of primary care trusts and uh, you know, community services when Lansley reforms went through and there was talk then of shifting care out into the community and, and creating this kind of, of stuff and it didn't really happen and are, are you worried that that all through, despite the enthusiasm for this 
when the funding necessarily isn't there, the workforce is going in the wrong direction. Are, are there actually systemic issues that are undermining some of what you want to see? So the activity is already there, isn't it? We know, you know, whatever 90 plus, 90 plus percent of the activity happens not in a hospital setting. Over my career of running a system and running the Surrey system, we have managed to move money between organisations, but it is very difficult. The thing that I've seen and we have done successfully, and I've seen other places do successfully, is moving people. And actually, that's what we need to do, is break down that concept of I'm, well, you know, Bob Claver at Imperial is a brilliant example of this. He's a hospital paediatrician at Imperial, but he goes out and sits in GP surgery to see children because actually he gets a much better response from it. Nobody, yeah. he's still being paid by the hospital, but he sees people. So it's that we've got, we need to break down the walls and the fixed thinking about if I'm a hospital consultant, I must deliver care in a hospital and actually go, this is where people need to be seen. Who have we got that can come and help us see them? And that means understanding your population because it will be different if you live in rural Surrey, you're going to need geriatrician plus community services around that. If you're in central London, it probably will be needing more mental health services or, or mm. uh, services for younger people. Yeah. And your report talked about those sort of rotational roles. I I'm interested, yeah. have you seen uh, a significant increase in those kinds of roles since you published the report? Or Because uh, we still have a problem with secondary care hospitals, you know, they're effectively the burning platforms of uh, the NHS, they're very visible and people like me get sort of, they're a gravity well that sucks in the coverage when actually one could argue primary care is the, the more severe burning platform that we need to pay attention to. So is there some resistance there between the two sectors that has to be overcome? But you yourself have just said that primary care is the burning platform. You have you in your opening gambit, you talked about the public dissatisfaction. I mean, we've corrected it to access to primary care. Uh, there is the there, of course, there is a really long waiting list. But I think it is already there as a I think it is already there in the, and it is already there in the public consciousness. And as professionals I've, I've it's funny it's interesting it's stopped of late but every, over, over the last year every time i saw people i haven't seen for ages they'd all go oh it's easier to see the pope than see a gp let me take a picture i'm with a gp but every time anybody does that i have got friends and colleagues that leave because they are working flat out and they are absolutely exhausted you know, a girl a woman woman i trained with who uh who i was as dedicated as you could be, you know, full-time partner, working flat out, always wanted to be a GP. She'd done a 12-hour day, hadn't eaten, hadn't peed, um, was going to get her lunch at nine o'clock at night from the garage, saw a patient who just went, oh, I love you to see a GP. Don't, don't, yeah. And she, I can't do this anymore. I mm -hmm. just can't work any harder. I just can't do any more. So there is a, there is, I would say there is absolutely a, public recognition of the burning platform but the problem is because the uh because the public narrative has come down to being isn't it funny G we can't get hold of gps anymore so we'll make a joke about it actually that is then further reinforcing the decline and the people just don't know what else to do or what else so we have got plans in place that will improve things but we need to be looking after the profession and i think that's the bit that's missing Mm. And then we, we're expecting the workforce plan uh, out in the next few hours. Imminent. Maybe tomorrow, well, yeah, maybe, maybe tomorrow, uh, someone tells me. Um, what do you want to see in the workforce plan for primary care? Uh, well, no, so I think for the NHS, I want to see an ongoing commitment to funding workforce, for ongoing commitment for uh, a different way of working and a recognition that actually more care happens, not necessarily in a hospital setting. Um, well, so, and, and I think we sometimes... Go on. Well, no, no, I was just going to say the Sunday Times reported recently that we don't think the workforce plan will be fully funded, uh, which does beg the question how how worthwhile this document will be. Well, let's wait and see, Sean, shall we? Let's not, I'm not in the land of speculation. So let's uh, let's have a look and then we can have that conversation, can't we? Fair enough. I'll, I'll, I'll get back in touch with you then, maybe. All um, right, then, that's we, fine. We are, we are close to time, Clarice. I think we could probably have had a conversation lasting a We could have gone all day. But, uh, um, <laughs> I, I did want to ask you about, you know, we're, we're 18 months maybe less from that, from the next general election. And if you believe the polls at the moment, we can have a, a Labour government uh, in place. And... Wes Streeting, the Shadow Health Secretary, has been quite vocal about primary care and the changes that he would want to see 
particularly to the GP model. And, and he's openly advocated potentially the, the slow evolution, he calls it, to get to a stage where perhaps we get rid of the, the partner model. Um, it, is that right? Is Labour at risk of going down the wrong path on all of this? So what, what would you say to him if he was on the call with us now? Now, I'll say what I always say on this one, which is that where the partnership model is working and thriving, you'd leave it alone. I, you know, it is incredibly effective that where it is working, but it is not working everywhere. We're very fortunate in Surrey that we have got thriving partnerships and people still want to be partners. And that is... Uh, an incredibly effective way of delivering care to populations and to communities. Where it isn't working, we may need to be looking at a different model. And look. And I think the thing we need to do before we go too far down that line is actually define what the operating, I mean, we all talk about operating models, don't we, these days, but what is the operating model in general practice? And what actually is the role of the GP as we go forward? Because if you go back to me when I started, which was no computer, no mobile phone and doing absolutely everything for anything, that is not the job now. And to be fair, it is not the job that the, the young uns coming in want to do. They want a portfolio. Many of them like to do virtual. They won't like to do different hours. We haven't really had that conversation about what is the role of the GP and therefore what actually should uh, we'd be looking at in terms of what, how we might want to deliver it. But my, my start message always is where the partnership model is working, leave it alone. Mm. And do you think there's a situation where um, secondary care trusts should be employing GPs and running the district care teams? And I know in some places they already do, don't they? But is that is that the solution we want to see or, or is it more that ICSs take control? I think it'll be different in different, there'll be different flavours in different places, won't it? And uh, and I think that's why it's really important that we then define what it is. When we mean, when we say running general practice, what do we mean by general practice? What do we then mean by the activity that will be run by the neighbourhood team? That's sort of that, that midway between using some secondary care, using some primary care. And I think that's absolutely local decisions for people to make that understand their communities and their needs and understand the workforce that they've got and got available. There is, there is, you know, and everybody wants a one size cookie cutter. There isn't one for this. Yeah. Well, I can see Ali is going to bring the big hook and pull me off stage. So I'll, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for that, Claire. I, I really enjoyed it. I think we. Me too, Sean. Thank you. It. Yeah, we'll do it again. Back to you, Ali. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sean and Claire. Honestly, it felt like being a fly on the wall a little bit to that that conversation. And I know that we could have gone on and on. And actually, you know, the chat in and of itself was, you know, there were lots of contributions there. Lots around. Actually, there isn't the one size fits all. Um, we do need to take the local approach. You know, we do need to recognise that actually it's not the issue of the GP as the individual, but actually the system in and of itself needs to build more of a supportive framework so that it can be, you know, it can run well and it can function well. And, and we aren't seeing such grand scales of exhaustion and burnout and these kind of things which are affecting our workforce. So um, thank you both so much. And I think um, don't doubt that we'll hear more from you especially as the as the week goes on as well with the you know the release of um you know upcoming things in the in the sector